And now I have the privilege of introducing this afternoon's guest speaker. Jeannie Ferber graduated from Principia College, college married the love of her life, Peter Ferber, the next day, and by the end of the summer, they had both joined the local branch church. Jeannie has been teaching Sunday school ever since, except when she served as first and second reader in each of the branches where they've been members. She has also served on every church committee except maintenance, out of mercy to her fellow members, she, says she. Jeannie worked for 10 years at the Mother Church, first with a Christian Science Monitor, then as manager of the Reading Room Department, and finally in the Journal Sentinel and Herald Editorial Department. During those years, she was sent around the country and overseas to give talks to branch churches. Jeannie's work at the Mother Church directly led to the work she is doing now. For the last 15 years, her practice of Christian science has involved working in or with more than 20 countries around the world to heal hatred, fear, and distrust, and to bring to light the spiritual individuality that unites us all. Jeannie works with people of many different cultures and religious backgrounds, as well as with refugees and those living in war zones. Throughout her journey, there is one thing that has been central. Every door has opened thanks solely to the life work of Mary Baker Eddy and Mrs. Eddy's faithful following of Christ Jesus. The greater the obedience to Mrs. Eddy's teachings, the greater the opportunities have been. Jeannie is fluent in Russian and is currently learning Dari, the language of Afghanistan. Her talk this afternoon comes from hymn six in our hymnal, Today Hath Need of Thee. Please join me now in warmly welcoming Jeannie Ferber. Hello, all you dear people. Oh, I'm so grateful to be here today. What a gift to be at Arnold Wood. I literally don't have words to thank John, the trustees, the dear staff and nurses, and all of those dear, dear residents who have made me feel so welcome. This is more than beautiful grounds. This is holy ground. And what a privilege to be on holy ground. It's also a privilege to be with people who are needed by God and used by God. So again, thank you for the gift of being with you. It makes me so happy to think that each of you are needed by God. What a thought that is. And it also makes me happy that you and I have come here today because we yearn to hear the voice of the Christ. That's the voice we want to hear. So that's the voice we're all going to listen for today, including me. Today, we're going to be talking about comforting and healing what comes into our experience, because that's why it's come to us. Each of us is given the experience that best leads us to God. And so there's no need to look at this person or that person and say, oh, they had such a wonderful experience. They did so many things. No, no, no. We don't look anywhere around at someone else. We thank God that he is giving each of us the exact experience we need to lead us to him. So how does God have need of us? God has need of each one of us everywhere and wherever we are. Spiritual purpose has no end to being purposeful and no limit to where it can be purposeful. But let's be clear on how we're needed. 
the one we call the discoverer, founder, and leader of Christian science, Mary Baker Eddy, she told us plainly, like a mother, giving her children her most valuable counsel. She wrote, Beloved children, the world has need of you and more as children than as men and women. It needs your innocence, unselfishness, faithful affection, uncontaminated lives. You need also to watch and pray that you preserve these virtues unstained and lose them not through contact with the world." End quote. To preserve in us what will most bless the world comes simply from loving God more than we love the things of the world, from loving God more than all else. For everything real, everything good and needful comes as a result of that love. Everything, everything we need comes from loving God more. Love for God is the richest mental soil there is. From it grows all good. From it comes all healing. From it comes every answer to every need. Everything that needs to be done on earth can be done and will be done. As mankind increases its reverence for divine love. For that love is the source of inexhaustible good, limitless inspiration, and infinite supply, simply infinite supply. We cannot guard our love for God too carefully or watch or pray too earnestly for that love to be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. So the starting point of being more productive more needed, more purposeful, is loving God more. In proportion to our love for God, will God use us for his purposes? There is no end date in God's plan for us because there's no end date to God's love. And there are surely no retirement benefits in God's plan for us. There are only life benefits a life full of progress, meaning, and purpose. One of the greatest illnesses of our day is the sorrow of heart that says we are not needed or valued, be that refugees cut off from humanity in sheer human decency, be that women suppressed by societal norms, youths trying to find their way, or that most oppressive of all lies, the lie that we reach some mysterious point in our lives when we can no longer serve. Can divine love be less than expressed? And is not divine love's expression tangibly expressed through us? Love's ideas. Can inspiration not be needed? Can good retire? Well, how absurd, of course not. To God, the only acceptable condition is fullness of life. Fullness of life is ours by virtue of the fact that true consciousness is the reflection of God. God has given each of us usefulness, productivity, and purposefulness without end, literally without end. How can good coming from God end? How? Furthermore, our usefulness is according to law, not according to chance or privilege. This law states that we reflect the ever active mind that is God. This mental activity is no pale lesser activity. You and I know that all true activity is mental, even though its result is practical. To help make this point in a concrete way, think for a moment about all it takes to build a road. 
Every road that links this country so usefully together took a tremendous amount of effort to build. And yet, you can be sure that the courageous, faithful, strong, untiring prayers of some dear one temporarily lying on a bed of pain, working out his or her salvation through prayer, is accomplishing even greater things and taking humanity farther and higher than any man-made road. Those prayers bless our world in a way we yet scarcely understand. We are never in a place or position where we cannot be used by God, period. Never in a place or position where we cannot be used by God. Again, the reason is because mental activity is not our own. It exists as the reflection of God. By simple logic, we are as active as God mind is active. A ray of light can't diminish or shut itself down. It is maintained by its source. We are not our own. We shine by reflected light. We are made, maintained, used, and expressed by God himself. Isn't that wonderful? On page 244 to 249 of Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, Mrs. Eddy, with ringing authority, wholly disdains the assumption of inevitable decrepitude or helplessness. Instead, she speaks of assigning to man everlasting grandeur, immortal development, power, and prestige. For example, she writes, Man, governed by immortal mind, is always beautiful and grand, always. Each succeeding year unfolds wisdom, beauty, and holiness, the greatest gift we can give to this world. The Bible, the book Mrs. Eddy loved more than all others, the book she turned to more than all others, and the book on which she based every statement in Science and Health is full of proof that God's purpose for us is not only sure but certain. It is precise, practical, and complete, even if it's guaranteed to be very challenging. So let's look at how God fulfills his purpose in us, and to do that, we're gonna look at the life of Moses, who, like so many of the prophets, was sent out into the wilderness. That is, Moses was sent into the place where he had nothing to look to or depend on but God. And that has everything to do with you and me fulfilling our purpose. Everything. So it is in the wilderness that God declares in all times and to all generations the most practical words ever spoken. I am that I am. You and I may not be called upon to lead a nation out of bondage, but you and I are called upon to practice the allness of God. Our purpose cannot could not be fulfilled in any other way but to demonstrate what God is and what he is doing, for he alone does all. The essential point is not the size of what we are called upon to do, but how we do even the smallest tasks that are given to us. That is so key. I would like to repeat it. The point here is not the size of what we are asked to do, but how we do the smallest task. There was never a time when the world so needed to depend on God, from the least to the greatest. The more we are dependent on him, the more good we will do. The more we are dependent on God, the more health and harmony there will be. And the more we are dependent on God, the more supply we will see right at hand. Even the smallest task is actually huge 
if it is demonstrating the presence of divine intelligence. For that intelligence subordinates all that is unlike good. So not only has divine intelligence been used, it's eliminated the ways that do not work. And is it not logical that God is constantly using his ideas or he would not be mined? Thus, everything, everything must and can be done as a demonstration of depending upon God if we will progress as a world. Whether it be Abraham or Moses, our beloved master, Christ Jesus, Mrs. Eddy or you or me, the lesson is still the same. To fulfill our purpose is to be wholly dependent on God. There is nothing more to be desired than to be dependent on God. There is no greater blessing on earth, no higher happiness, no safer, surer place to be and nothing more to be desired than to be wholly, happily, utterly dependent on God, because then God is free to fulfill his will. And his will is healing, and healing not just of our own ills, but the ills of the world. Healing not just if we think we know how enough to heal, but because we are willing to be used by God. Doing God's will is all that should concern us. And today has such need of us willing to be used by God, not occasionally, but constantly. Not just if the telephone rings with a call for help, but because the whole world is calling out hourly. How vital that we aren't content with praying for our own well-being, but pray and work for the well-being of all. I remember once on a trip overseas, my friends were telling me about the new rich of their country and how the newly rich tried to live apart from their country's problems. But then my friends laughed and said, they think they can forget the mess we're in, in their big, beautiful new houses, but every time they drive on our roads, they know exactly where they live. And those roads are quite amazing. <laughs> well, you and I are not to withdraw into mental houses of detachment, tricked by that awful lie that says, well, I would help if I could, but I really, what are my prayers going to do? We can do so much to help, as I hope you'll see by the end of the talk today. Whatever our daily tasks appear to be, those are the tasks that are to be used by God. God uses us where we are. As an example of this, several years ago, I was working overseas with some dear friends. Our hope was to go to a war-torn part of their country to buy school books for children as a sign of hope for their future. And I need to add that whenever I travel overseas, my daily prayer is to know that I am never on foreign ground, but only on holy ground where God is at work. Most of the friends with whom I was working were of a nationality that has long been in conflict with the small ethnic group of people we were hoping to help and where the fighting had just come to an end. But two of the friends in our group were of the ethnic background that had been under attack. So to be all working together was in itself very, very special. The first night together, as we were having a happy dinner in the apartment where I was staying, the music on the radio suddenly stopped with news of a large scale terrorist attack very close to where we were. It was the work of extremists who whose ethnic background was that of our two friends. Well, the fear that filled our friends' faces was like nothing I have ever seen before or since. All their lives, these dear people and their families and families like them have suffered unspeakably from acts of terrorists. They have had to move constantly from place to place because the actions of a few brand them all as bad people. 
just as they had come to participate in an act of kindness, once again, goodness and love seemed horribly mocked. I slipped away into another room and pulled out my Bible and Science and Health and began to pray. I don't know how long I read before the thought came to me that the reality of God's loving presence, God's loving presence is the refuge that we all have. It belongs to us all. God is our refuge and strength, says the Bible. That God was present comforting me was my proof that God was there present comforting all. Very soon after this thought came to me, there was a knock on my door, and one of our two friends poked his head through the door, and he intuitively understood I was praying. Could he just sit quietly, quietly with me, he asked, while I prayed. Well, of course, I said yes. I then shared some simple ideas with him about the presence of God's love, a power that nothing on earth can prevent from being felt. I don't know how long we talked, but soon a tangible peace filled the apartment. The TV and radio were shut off and the phone stopped ringing. The calmer atmosphere allowed us to make a plan to get our friends out of the city. It was particularly dangerous because of the magnitude of the attack. Men of this ethnic group, if found on the streets, were being taken into custody. Because of this, it was vital to get our friends on a plane home that evening as security would only tighten through the night and the coming days. The plan was to make two trips to the airport with only one friend at a time who would be taken by the most experienced member of our group. The first trip to the airport took much longer than usual as roadblocks were being put up everywhere. By the time the escort returned to get our second friend, there was very little time left to get back to the airport to catch the only remaining flight to the second man city. When the men left, I was left alone in the apartment, and I prayed earnestly, knowing that God would willingly and openly tell me what I needed to know, for there is no hidden truth. And certainly there's never a lack of truth. At one point, I opened my Bible, and my eyes fell on these words in Revelation. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Well, I knew the words were being given to me as the answer to my prayer and that I was to accept them fully, quickly, and gratefully. Here was that universal, eternal Christ at work in behalf of us all, revealing itself to all and for all. For the Christ light could no more just reveal itself to a few than the sun could shine on just a few. When the men reached the gate leading to the tarmac, the attendant said that the door of the plane was already shut in preparation for takeoff. Yet, the escort from our group found himself saying something that he told me later surprised him as much as anyone. He found himself saying, you can open the door. There is still time. The plane hasn't begun to taxi. The plane was held, and our friend allowed to get on and fly home as a free, honest, and good man. The two men not only made it back to their home safely, in subsequent days they were able to buy the school books for the children, and the good we all so yearned to do was not mocked. In order to not only help, but uplift and heal, what comes into our experience, let's go back to the point that we made at the start of this section of the talk. To be used by God, we must be wholly dependent on him. And it seems to me that this is the hallmark of the prophets, of Christ Jesus, of Paul, of Mrs. Eddy. So let it be our hallmark. Let us be known as the ones who are 
wholly dependent on God, not partially, wholly. Let's look now at a Bible story that helps us understand one of the things that often tries to keep us from fulfilling our God-given purpose. And the story I'm thinking about is Jonah and that great God-obedient fish who for three long days put up with that bitter little mortal in his belly. Poor fish, I'm sure God rewarded that fish. In fleeing to Tarshish, Jonah was embarking on a journey that he was hoping would take him 2,000 miles in the opposite direction. <laughs> but, you know, we shouldn't be too quick to laugh at Jonah. Who among us has not run many more mental miles to try to avoid some spiritual demand? There is no question that Jonah loved God, but he balked at what God had in store for him because he didn't agree with God's plan. Jonah was being asked to warn Nineveh of materialism. Admittedly, no small task. It wasn't, however, that Jonah doubted if God's love could fully break the mesmerism of materialism. Jonah, we read, didn't think they deserved to be warned or saved by God. We read that it displeased him exceedingly and that Jonah was very angry at the thought of God saving them. Well, here again, perhaps, we see something perhaps recognizable in our times. Do aggressive trends of today make us so upset that we feel those who follow them don't deserve God's love, don't deserve to be healed, can't be healed, or won't be healed for whatever reason? If we think that only some qualify for God's love, we need to look again at the Bible. Look at the lives of Moses, Jacob, David, Paul, and ask what we can learn from those lives. As in the story of Jonah, God's grace is available to all, always. The beauty of this story is that everyone was saved by one man's obedience. When Jonah obeyed God, Jonah was saved along with the entire city and his story, his obedience, continues to save us. Can we possibly doubt how huge and far-reaching God's purpose is? And can we also see from this story what a travesty it would be if it were possible to willfully refuse God's way? But that is not possible, for God's love is unfailing. That's what divine love is, that which never fails. And so we also now have the master's example. So we will not willfully turn away from God's demands, but we will follow our master whose prayer is our prayer. Not my will, but thine be done. One of the biggest lessons I've learned in recent years is that as human effort and human will give place to prayer, spiritual growth and demonstration, the work given to us is less labored, less material, and more progressive. I have also learned that success is never to be measured in material terms. Never, capital N, period. That's a trick, dear ones. We measure our progress by how we are progressing spiritually. That which heals, that which moves humanity out of its conflicts and sufferings is that which moves thought spiritward, that which lifts thought out of its materialism, and that alone results in true progress. So we must learn to measure success spiritually. Only then can we have a meaningful sense of the effectiveness of our work. And however slow our progress, we still obey God, knowing that when we are ready for progress, we will progress. Now here's an example of what I mean by that. When we're ready for progress, we will progress. A few years ago, I read a story in the Christian Science Monitor about an organization in the Middle East working to help educate girls and give them a voice through writing. 
And during that time, the words, Today hath need of thee, had been coming to me daily for weeks. And so I thought, well, perhaps this is what I'm supposed to do to contact this organization. But before writing them, I prayed. And I opened my Bible, and my eyes fell on the words from Isaiah, Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. Well, I thanked God for what seemed to be a very clear message and sent off an email to the organization. Weeks went by with no reply, despite the fact that the organization's website said they very much needed volunteers teaching English and teaching writing. Now, just to make this story clear, I need to say that today it's not the least bit unusual for people all over the world to teach students by computer programs where you can see each other and talk to each other. So it's just like you and I are sitting here in this room, but you're simply seeing each other through a computer. And that was how the work would take place, by a computer program, by speaking that way. Well, after months of no reply, of course, I couldn't help but wonder what went wrong. So all I could do was to continue to pray, to ask God again to show me how I was needed. I turned again to the Bible, and it opened to the exact same page that I mentioned earlier. But this time, my eyes fell on words that come farther down on the page. The words were these, And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Well, as in the experience I related earlier, I knew these words were to be rejoiced in and obeyed. How they would be fulfilled on the human scene, I had no clue. But I knew they were to be accepted wholeheartedly. In short, I was to yield my sense of things to God's higher ways and allow more spiritual purpose to be at work. The same day this new insight came, I sent off another letter to the organization. I heard back from them in less than an hour and began work in two weeks. Step by step, God did indeed fulfill his promise in showing me that his purpose for us is spiritual and utterly practical. Over time, my work grew to include children from eight countries many of those over half of them countries where there is presently war and where there are refugees and so as the lessons progressed it became very clear that this was god's opportunity and i was to allow it to be god's opportunity let me give you an example one week one of my students asked if we could listen to the words of a popular rock song that he had heard and liked, and he wanted to learn the words. Well, I know that hardly seems like the potential for spiritual purpose, but as it happened, the word God was in the song. And when the student got to that word, he said to me, please, could you tell me what it means to be the child of God? Those were his words, not just God. Could you tell me what it means? to be the child of God. Well, you can be sure that class was not an English lesson. During another lesson with a student who lives currently in a war zone, gunfire could be heard going off in the background. He was distraught and said his family had not been able to sleep for two nights. The student loves classical music, and so I asked him to tell me what his favorite piece of music was. I told him I would find it on the internet and we would listen to it together. Now this obviously was not the lesson I had had planned for that day. It was simply the idea given to me as I reached out in prayer, and were never to question those ideas. So just imagine of all all the classical music my student could have chosen, he replied, let's listen to the fourth movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. When we finished listening to the piece, I told him that this melody was used 
as a loved hymn, hymn number 58, in my church, and that while we had been listening to it, I had been praying the words with all my heart. So then he said to me, please, would you tell me the words? Well, you can only imagine the peace that filled his face when I read to him, in thy house, securely dwelling, where thy children live to bless, seeing only thy creation, we can share thy happiness, share thy joy and spend it freely. Loyal hearts can feel no fear. We, thy children, know thee, Father, love and life forever near. He was so touched by the whole experience, as was I, because it was clearly given by God. I can honestly say that during the lesson, I became totally unaware of the gunfire, which did stop that night. One more story. Another student, this in another country, a little third grader, was so shy when we first began lessons together, English lessons, that it was almost painful for her to talk. Finally, it came out one week that her teachers at school had told her that she had a physical defect and said she would never speak normally, and so she was ashamed and embarrassed. When the student told me this, I simply replied that she didn't have to believe everything everyone told her. I didn't say any more to her than that. I left it at that. But week by week, I saw that I was to so let the Christ light shine in my own thought that she could see herself in that light. As practicing Christian scientists, we naturally bring the light of truth into whatever room or opportunity we find ourselves in. And we must allow nothing to shut off that light, neither preconceived ideas of who is responsive to the Christ or the awful lie that that Christ light is too pale to be seen or felt or responded to. One year later, this little child during a lesson held up a certificate and told me she had won her school's reading aloud contest. She was completely healed. Wherever we are, and whatever our days entail, the fullness and joy of spiritual purpose is ours to participate in. Indeed, there is a law of God that guarantees we will be used by God. That law states, and this is from Science and Health, God expresses in man the infinite idea forever developing itself broadening and rising higher and higher from a boundless basis. That promise is given to each of us without exception. What greater calling do we each have and what more satisfying work than to love God, to be dependent on God, to yield to God? And so my greatest hope is today that you will leave with these five words ringing in your hearts today and every day. Today hath need of thee. Today hath need of thee. Thank you for being needed and for responding.